In my last lecture, I downloaded a lot of information. Today, my plan is for you to spend less time dozing to my disembodied voice and more time sharing insights with your classmates. Our focus will be comparing works across cultures and gleaning insights into those cultures from their art. So let's start with the last work we examined, the Niobides Crater. Like The Last Judgment of Hunifer, this work contains a narrative of human encounters with the gods. In both cases, the gods have the final word, but otherwise, the narratives are very different. How are they different? And which narrative comes closer to the narratives we encounter in our own Christian tradition? Well, oddly enough, since we think of ourselves generally as much closer culturally to the Greeks than to the Egyptians, I think that in moral and theological terms, we're probably more comfortable, at least I'm probably more comfortable with the Egyptian narrative. The Egyptian gods, after all, dispense judgment based on whether human beings chose the right or the wrong. The Greek gods, it seems to me, mostly just display petty vengeance. What stylistic similarities and differences do you notice? Well, there are similarities. The figures are mostly in profile, although some of Niobe's children are shown in three-quarters view, which, by the way, was an important innovation at the time. Remember, this is still an early Greek work. This is still the Archaic Era. Uh, the gods are somewhat higher than the mortals in both works. It's actually more pronounced in the Greek painting. But even though both narratives include movement, only the Greek figures really seem to be moving through space. The unchanging world of Egyptian cosmology has given way to a more dynamic, but maybe somewhat more disturbing vision. So here we see two processions. On the top, representatives bringing tribute to the king of Persia at Persepolis, and Athenians on the bottom bringing tribute to Athena on the Parthenon of the Acropolis, the Panathenaic procession. We've talked about the Panathenaic procession, and you've now learned something about the Persians. The procession you see here on top, from the staircase leading to the platform of the king's great audience hall, or Abadana, probably depicts a New Year's festival procession where representatives of 23 subject nations brought gifts to the king of the Persian Empire. So, you're about to learn more about Persepolis. For now, let's just talk about the form of these two friezes. How are they similar and different? Well, there are actually a lot of similarities. They're both very vertical. The folds of the draperies are rendered meticulously in both works. And in fact, art historians think that the Persian artists were influenced by what they knew of Greek styles and of Greek art. And while the Greek drapery is somewhat more realistic, it's still very straight. Some art historians think it was deliberately imitating the fluting of the columns on the Parthenon. But, and this is really the big difference, under that drapery, the Greeks obviously have real bodies. We see clear outlines of knees and legs, and we see them bending and moving. The feet, likewise, are moving much more naturally. We don't have this odd comp composite perspective where the chest and shoulders are facing front, but the legs are moving forward in profile. Very uncomfortable looking. I tried to blow up the faces, not entirely successfully, but what similarities and differences do you see? Well, in both cases, the faces are really quite serene, but it seems to me that the Greek faces are still somewhat more individual and expressive, although maybe I'm just reading into it what I know about Greek art. On the other hand, the Greeks' clothing is all very similar, uh, and probably the women were deliberately dressed very similarly. Well, the figures on the Persian frieze are dressed very differently. Why is that? What information is that conveying? Well, actually, the similarity and difference in clothing takes us to the very heart of the differences between these processions and really between these two cultures. In Persepolis, the representatives of 23 nations are bringing tribute to the Persian king. In Athens, the processors are all Athenians, although I'd note that the women, even though they're probably the daughters of high-ranking families, are not and cannot be citizens. Persepolis is an empire. Greece is a democracy of sorts. 
The Persepolis Freeze celebrates the diversity of an empire, but also the unquestioned sovereignty of its king. The Greeks, well, they're celebrating themselves, as well as their goddess Athena, but even she, like all the members of the Greek pantheon, seems to be made in a human image and to behave and misbehave much like other human beings. So the collision between the Greek city-states and the mighty multicultural Persian Empire will shape the history of the world for centuries to come. Europeans and their descendants have usually celebrated the Greek victory. The good guys won a victory for humanism, for self-determination, and depending on the political standpoint of the people uh, celebrating this victory, even a victory for democracy. Although, of course, the Greek city-states that united to fight Persia were by no means all democracy. Democracies in Sparta, which was really the leading land power, was about as far from democratic as the state could get. One reason why I really like the crash course video on Greeks versus Persians that we assigned for last night's homework is it gives a rather different slant to this tale. So, what's to like about the Persians? Well, there's a lot to like, as you learned. They were religiously tolerant. They allowed subject peoples to keep their leaders and their religions. And in fact, the Ionian Greeks who rebelled against the Persians were led by a Greek. Uh, They were, they were uh, again, allowed to keep their leaders and their religions as long as they did not rebel against Persian rule and they did not keep slaves, very much in contrast to the Greeks. So here we see the two college board images from Darius's capital, Persepolis, in modern-day Iran. Below, you see an overview of the Abadana, or audience hall, and especially those huge stone pillars that you saw in the Khan Academy podcast. Above, you see the grand staircase with its famous processional frieze. Now, I added the double-headed griffin capital. It is not a college board required work, mostly because I think it's really cool. It is so hard to get a sense of these vast public spaces just from a photo. So let's watch a brief video from UNESCO, which is the UN's cultural and educational organization. So here are a few more photos of the staircase that we see only distantly in the College Board image. What messages do you think are sent by the upward movement of the tribute bearers? Well, they need to ascend to the level of the king, right? And what about the lion attacking the bull? Both animals, after all, are traditionally symbols of strength. Actually, art historians are argue, still arguing about that question. One interpretation, uh, based on other iconography from Persia and the Near East, is that the lion represents the sun and the bull represents the moon. So this is a representation of the day defeating the night. Maybe it represents enlightenment of Persian rule. Note, however, how many public spaces seem to relate in some way to the movement of the heavens. That's worth thinking about as you move into some comparative analysis, and here we go. Believe it or not, I'm almost done talking. You're going to be spending the rest of the class making comparisons among these six public spaces, all pictured on the slide. Ms. Jacobs is going to break you into groups where we want you to brainstorm about the big four, Function, content, context, and form. How can we use these to describe and understand the public spaces you've been assigned? And how does the design of these public spaces relate to the cultural imperatives of the places where they were created? You should check your workbook notes, and I've also provided some websites for a further look. I recommend you divide these up among members of the group. Pay special attention to the kinds of processions, festivals, or ceremonies that were performed in these spaces, and how the spaces accommodated and reinforced these spaces. You briefly encountered the gates in your reading for this lesson. We'll talk about it more at the end of the year. It's actually a real college board favorite. I actually intended to introduce this work right after Stonehenge, but I'm pretty sure you ran out of time. So if you have time now, you might want to watch the last three minutes of my final prehistoric art podcast and meet this rather bizarre work of art, which the college board frankly loves more than I do.